Hello everyone and welcome back. I'm Joe Chappelle and you're listening to episode 18 of the OBGYN podcast. I hope you all enjoyed the latest Journal Club episode with Dr. Ballas. I think it prompted an interesting conversation about home births and more broadly how doctors and midwives interact differently in different parts of the world. Now this is a topic that is ripe for more discussion and it is something that I want to pursue further. Now, I don't quite have all the pieces lined up yet, but look for something interesting in the coming months to keep that ball rolling. Well, for today, I had to postpone my original plan for this series of episodes because I think that we have some more things to discuss when it comes to electronic fetal monitoring. As I discussed in the last episode, the promise of the electronic fetal monitoring has been largely unfulfilled, even in the modest effect it does have on perinatal mortality, and certainly to a less degree in the nerve developmental issues and it certainly comes with trade-offs that make its universal use problematic. Despite these shortcomings, it has been continued to be used throughout the world, and instead of limiting its use, researchers and clinicians have tried to find additional methods to increase its utility, and that is what I want to talk about today. Before I get into it, though, I want to make a statement about bias again. Now, I am in my late 30s, which means that I did not live through any but the most recent events in obstetric history. My take on these subjects and how they played out comes through reading tons of papers, and in some cases, reading between the lines to figure out what the overall timeline was. There are dozens of papers that I read for every episode, and most of these are not included, because in order to tell a coherent story, I need to trim some of it. Now, I think that I stay true to the overall narrative of the chain of events, but please keep in mind that you are definitely getting the Joe Chappelle version of this story. It also means that if you have a different take on this or any other subject, then I want to hear from you. I can and will respond either through personal correspondence, blog entry, or even right here in the podcast. This is especially true if I get something wrong. Speaking of which, in the last episode, I mistakenly stated that the U.S. perinatal mortality rate was 6%, when in fact it is 0.6% or 6 per thousand. I want to say thank you to Dr. Burgery from Norway for catching that. The other follow-up for today comes from a listener from Serbia who asked about transcripts for the show. Now, it's something I would love to add and I have looked into it, but unfortunately transcripts are extremely costly. And although I have a very understanding and supportive spouse, I'm not sure she would let me add that to the monthly expense that is this podcast. I am considering opening up a subscription system which would allow those who feel so inclined to contribute to the show and allow me to add things like transcripts. I'm also considering adding some advertising to cover the cost, but I'm not really sure if I want to pursue that yet either. I would love feedback from all of you if this is something you would like, and in the meantime, I'll keep thinking it through. Now, all that said, let's get started with episode 18, Intrapartum Fetal Monitoring, Part 2. In our last episode, we discussed several papers that described how useful continuous electronic fetal monitoring is at preventing perinatal death and neurodevelopmental compromise. In one of the larger studies, they found that the number needed to monitor was over 30,000 for term uncomplicated labors. This low positive predictive value, which you'll remember is directly affected by the incidence of the process being studied, leads to a remarkably high false positive rate, and therefore to countless unnecessary interventions. The theory of intrapartum hypoxia as a cause of cerebral palsy was very alluring, and as we discussed in the last episode, was one of the drivers towards universal adoption. Unfortunately, that theory has now largely been disproven, and yet here we are, stuck with this paradigm for continuous monitoring. In fact, in one study published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1996, they found that abnormalities in electronic fetal monitoring had a 98.8% false positive rate for predicting cerebral palsy. So today, we're going to talk about other methods for trying to reduce that false positive rate. The first one of these to hit the scene and see widespread adoption was fetal scalp blood sampling. And before we get into the specifics of the test, let me start with a short primer on fetal acidosis. Throughout our lives, all animals can become acidotic, either due to decreased respirations, aka respiratory acidosis, or due to an increase or decrease in metabolic products that change the pH balance, or, in other words, metabolic acidosis. Because a fetus does not breathe and instead performs all of its respiration via the placenta, anything that disrupts placental blood can cause acidosis. This can be decreased perfusion to the uterus due to maternal blood pressure issues, tachycystole, or placental abruption. Regardless of the cause, fetal acidosis can be a sign of fetal hypoxia, 
which is associated with ischemic processes in the fetal brain. Therefore, it is not unreasonable to think that if we can tell which babies have acidosis, then we know which babies are at risk for neurologic injury. Now, this rationale should seem familiar because it's similar to the rationale for electronic fetal monitoring. Now that we've gone through that, how do we actually get blood from the baby? Well, getting a blood pH from a neonate, that's relatively easy. We just take it from the umbilical cord at birth. For fetuses, however, it is a little more complicated. So how do we do it? Well, the most obvious point of access was the fetal scalp because it was accessible through the dilated cervix. A small plastic cone is placed on the fetal head, which is then used to clean the scalp and apply silicone to stop the blood droplet in place. Then, a lancet was used to make a small nick, and a small heparinized capillary tube was placed through the cone in order to collect the blood. Care must be taken to prevent any air from entering the tube, as this could affect the result. The tube then must be immediately capped and mixed to prevent microclot formation. The tube is then inserted into a blood gas machine to get a result. Pressure must be then be applied to the fetal scalp for two contractions, and then watched for two contractions to ensure no further bleeding. Now, as you can see, this is a little bit of an involved process, with many pathways to introducing error. Not to say that it's that hard to perform, but it certainly does require training and standardization if the results are going to be trusted. To give a few examples where things can go wrong, having air in the capillary tube can increase the pH, contamination with amniotic fluid can decrease the pH, and collected blood from an area of the head with caput can also decrease the pH. These issues, as well as the move away from poorly controlled point-of-care tests, have contributed to the decrease in scalp pH utilization in the United States. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we get there, let's talk about the science behind it. One of the early investigators into this topic was Dr. Eric Seiling from Berlin. He left a strong legacy in many areas of obstetrics. He published two papers in the late 60s that described what the average pH was for laboring fetuses with some sign of distress. Now, I want to spend a minute talking about the larger of the two studies because its findings form the foundation for all the subsequent studies. In Dr. Sandling's paper, they chose to perform fetal scalp pH testing for labors complicated by meconium stained fluid, decelerations below 120 beats per minute, or baseline heart rate above 150 beats per minute. They included 306 singleton labors with babies born with normal APGARs. 42% of the sampling was done from meconium. 40% for an elevated heart rate, and only 7% for a decreased heart rate. They found the average pH was around 7.32 in early labor, and fell throughout labor to an average of 7.27, with a two standard deviation being 7.17. This drop in pH as labor goes on is not surprising, because during the second stage of labor, women experience more frequent and more intense contractions, and we know that blood flow to the placenta is diminished during contractions. This study is so impactful to the rest of our story because the authors argue that 7.2 is the floor for healthy babies and that anything below that is pathologic. As you can see, this is not at all what they proved. What they proved was that two standard deviations below the average for vigorous babies was pH of 7.2. A separate group of depressed neonates with low APGAR scores would have been needed to prove that there was a difference in their pH and then furthermore, all we're talking about here is APGAR scores, which are not easily translatable to long-term neonatal outcomes. In fact, other studies, such as one by Sykes et al. in The Lancet in 1982, found that acidosis and low APGAR scores are not very well associated at all. They found that only 21% of babies with a 5-minute APGAR score less than 7 had a pH less than 7.1. Put another way, 86% of babies with a pH less than 7.1 had a 5-minute APGAR greater than or equal to 7. Now, to take that a step even further, we can look at a paper from Ye et al. in the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, where they reviewed over 51,000 deliveries where cord pH and neonatal outcomes were available. They found that only 0.36% of neonates with a cord pH of less than 7.1 had an adverse neurologic outcome, and that 75% of neonates with an adverse outcome, had a pH of greater than 7.1 at birth. So, like electronic fetal monitoring, this is not a sensitive nor specific tool. Now you might say, well, you know, those were umbilical cord pHs at delivery, and not intrapartum scalp pHs, 
and so we really shouldn't draw an equivalence between them. Well, to that, I would say, if the pH is a poor predictor at birth, how could it perform any better intrapartum? Now, all that being said, let's put scalp pH into a historical perspective, and remember that it was coming of age at the exact same time as electronic fetal monitoring. And during the 70s, the two methods were further refined, and several groups attempted to use the two together to overcome the deficiencies of both. One paper to describe this process comes from Halifax and was published in the Gray Journal in 1980 by David Young et al. In their study, they used electronic fetal monitoring to identify fetuses deemed to be at risk of hypoxia, and then used fetal scalp pH to determine if the fetuses were in fact acidotic. Now, the primary problem with this approach, and with all of these studies, is that they are using an inexact method, namely electronic fetal monitoring, to determine who to include. It is certainly possible that the babies born with normal fetal heart rate strips were acidotic, but we don't know, because they weren't included in this study, or really any others. Well, in any case, Dr. Young and his team found that two-thirds of the scalp pHs were performed for variable decelerations, 10% for late decelerations, 10% for reduced variability, and 12% for changes in baseline. With our modern knowledge that these tracings represent a very heterogeneous population of babies, it makes interpreting these results murky, but, you know, we're going to try anyway. So, they define severe acidosis as less than 7.19, based on the papers by Dr. Salling and others, and mild acidosis as 7.2 to 7.24. They found that the most of the severely acidotic babies were born after having persistent late decelerations or persistent severe variable decelerations with long recovery. Only six babies out of the group had a pH of less than 7.19, and of those babies, only three had an OPGAR less than 7. Importantly, though, they also found that only four of the 76 babies with a normal pH had a low APGAR score. So just like electronic fetal monitoring, scalp pH has a low positive predictive value and at least a decent negative predictive value. The two other important pieces from this article, and the reasons I am spending time on it, are the rate of complications from the procedure and the claim that it reduces the number of cesarean deliveries. Let's start with the claim made by this paper and many others that this procedure, when combined with continuous fetal heart rate monitoring, can reduce the number of cesarean deliveries performed because it helps reduce the false positive rate. When analyzed the way it is in the paper, this is what they found. They found that using the information from scalp pHs, they were able to prevent about 21 cesarean deliveries. This equals a reduction in cesarean deliveries from 32% to 23%. Now this is nothing to sneeze at, but the real question here is, why were those C-sections being performed in the first place? I think the lesson that should have been learned from this paper, and others like it, is that we should be very careful about performing cesarean deliveries for changes in the fetal heart rate, period, except in very certain circumstances. The other major comp- consideration is that of complications. In the 232 fetuses who underwent this procedure in Dr. Young's paper, there were 15 complications, of which most were scalp hematomas and infections. Now, a 6% complication rate is not too bad, but we have to remember our driving principle in healthcare, and that is first, do no harm. If babies are being saved from death or severe neurologic complications, then 6% is not a big deal. If, however, the procedure adds little value, then perhaps we are doing harm. This was recognized at the time, and as early as as 1982, doctors Clark and Miller from the University of Southern California were trying to find a replacement for fetal scalp pH. They had observed that when scalp pH was performed, the fetuses would predictably have a rise in fetal heart rate. In their 1982 paper, they showed that this was true for almost all fetuses with a pH over 7.2, and that none of the fetuses with a pH under 7.2 had this rise in heart rate during this fetal scalp pH. In 1984, they published a follow-up study where they first stimulated the fetal head with a finger or blunt clamp and recorded the change in heart rate, and then proceeded on to perform the routine scalp pH. What they found should start to sound familiar to us. They found that none of the babies that responded with an increase in heart rate of at least 15 beats per minute for at least 15 seconds had a pH less than 7.2. However, for those babies that did not respond to the scalp stimulation, only 40% had a pH less than 7.2. This means, again, that scalp stimulation has a good negative predictive value 
and is almost useless positive predictive value. Unfortunately, since the pH already has a poor positive predictive value, this only compounds the problem. That being said, scalp stimulation does have some benefits. It's easy to do, doesn't require any special equipment or training, and poses no danger to the fetus. Now, these findings were taken to heart at USC, and by 1992, almost no scalp pHs were being performed. In 1994, Dr. Goodwins, Milner, and Paul looked back to this era to see if the decline in the use of scalp pH had any effect on the rate of cesarean delivery or neonatal outcomes. They found the rate of scalp pH had peaked in 1987 at 2.2% of deliveries, and by 1992 had fallen to 0.03% of all deliveries. Although not addressed in the paper, I must assume that they replaced it with fetal scalp stimulation, as the work by Clark and Miller was performed there. If that is the case, and scalp stimulation works as advertised, then it should be no surprise that they found no difference in the cesarean delivery rates or neonatal outcomes. Now, other academic delivery units weren't as progressive, and instead incorporated scalp stimulation into their fetal well-being algorithm. Abnormal tracings would be identified, scalp stimulation would be performed, and if no response was noted, then scalp pH would be performed. A study performed at New York Medical College by Alimi and Figueroa and Tahani evaluated just this. They found that a reassuring response, instead of the 15 by 15, could actually be 10 beats per minute for 10 seconds. And additionally, that moderate variability, irregardless of the rise in fetal heart rate, was a sign of a normal pH. In doing so, they found an improved negative predictive value, but also that even in the absence of a fetal heart rate reaction and with minimal or absent variability, the rate of pH less than 7.2 was only 45%. So even in this heavily modified algorithm, it was not great at predicting a low pH, which is, in itself, not great at predicting fetal compromise. Now, I know I'm repeating myself a lot here, but I'm trying to drive home the point. When we build things on top of faulty assumptions and reasonings, we are doomed to failure. In the first place, we started with intermittent fetal heart rate monitoring, and in 1968 found that although it could tell us which babies were not at risk for labor-related injuries, it was not great at predicting babies that were at risk. So, we swapped that for continuous fetal monitoring, and found that, you know, it wasn't so great either. So instead of stopping there, we decided that what we really needed to do was find a better way of sorting babies into the correct columns. So, first we adopted scalp pH, and found that although it helped put more babies into the healthy column, it didn't really fix our false positive problem. Then, because that technique had significant barriers in its need for specialized equipment and training, and carried risk to the fetus, we took a step back and replaced it with scalp stim, which is not great at identifying the babies with low pH either. To put some numbers into this equation, scalp stimulation only identifies about 50% of the babies that will have a low pH, and only about half a percent of babies with a low pH will have a poor outcome. That means that for every 100 babies with a concerning tracing, only two will have a poor outcome, which means that we would be performing 50 cesarean or operative deliveries for every poor outcome prevented, and that, I'm afraid, is an optimistic calculation. What that all brings me back to is why did we stop doing scalp pHs? Well, I think it has to do with a combination of factors. First is the cost and training needed to perform scalp pH, and the other is that we have gotten better at interpreting fetal heart rate tracings. As I mentioned in the last episode, the 2008 NICHD guidelines took a lot of work that I talked about today and used it to feed back into our fetal heart rate interpretations. In doing so, they mostly eliminated the need for at least the scalp pH. By understanding which tracings are most often associated with low pH, or in reality to understand which tracings are never associated with low pH, then we can improve our outcomes. This is essentially what the category 1, 2, and 3 are. Only category 3 is reliably associated with a low pH, and as we discussed, even then only about 50% of the babies will actually be acidotic. With the addition of scalp stim when the tracing is category 3, we can further separate concerning from not. All of this can lead to less interventions. Of course, one could argue, and I guess I've been doing this for the last two episodes, that maybe we shouldn't be doing any of this at all. Maybe it is time to give up on continuous fetal monitoring. Unfortunately, that seems unlikely, especially here in the U.S., and so I guess whatever we can do to make it less bad is worthwhile. Now, I'm going to stop here for today, 
I was planning on getting into fetal pulse ox and ST waveform analysis, but like many topics, this one took me longer than I thought, and so I'll save those for the next episodes where I can give them their full due. I don't mean to be so negative about electronic fetal monitoring, but I do want everyone to realize the limitations of our current paradigm. It is only when we understand those limitations that we can put these tools into their proper place. The key to reducing unnecessary intervention lies not just in getting better tools, but also in how, to, how we deploy those tools. Now, I find it encouraging that in the 1970s, we thought that intermittent variable decelerations were concerning and were grounds for performing a cesarean delivery. Now, we know those are not signs of fetal compromise. This means that we are making progress, and if we remember just how bad electronic fetal monitoring and scalp pH and scalp stim are at predicting neonatal outcomes, then maybe we'll be less likely to pull the trigger on an operative delivery. Like I said, in the next episode, we're going to tackle fetal pulse oximetry and ST waveform analysis. For the show notes for this and every episode, you can go to www.obgyn.fm. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at the OBGYN podcast or at jchappellemd. And you can find us on Facebook as well. If you want to join the Slack, then please send me an email at feedback at obgyn.fm or you can tweet at me as well. And lastly, If you enjoy the show, please consider giving a short review on iTunes. iTunes remains the most prominent place to find podcasts, and your review can help others find us here. With all that said, thank you for listening.